This is Channel 7's Eyewitness News with Judd Ambrick, John Schubeck, and the Eyewitness News team. Good evening, I'm Judd Ambrick. Here's what's happening at 11 o'clock. The gunfire has stopped and the flames are out, but a big question mark still hangs over South Central Los Angeles at this very moment. A question as large and perhaps as tragic as any on the West Coast in the last 103 days. Is the body of Patty Hearst among the five found early tonight in a shot-up, burned-out home on 54th and Compton Avenues? A home that went up in unchecked flames as the climax of a shootout in which Los Angeles police fired more ammunition than they ever had fired before in a single law enforcement assault. Just who are the five persons killed? That still is not known. If any of them have been identified, it's not been officially disclosed. At Hillsborough, California, the Randolph Hearst family has apparently given in to the inevitable fear. A family spokesman said tonight that the feeling inside the Hearst home is that it's all over for Patty. Yet despite that atmosphere, the family spokesman added that the Hearst still are clinging to some hope that their daughter was somewhere else, not in a stucco house at Compton and 54th Avenue here in Los Angeles. John, you have more. Judd, we certainly do. We still have nothing official at this hour to say with certainty that the five persons who died in that shootout were actually members of the Simbini's Liberation Army. Dr. Thomas Noguchi is even now trying to identify the bodies, some of which were burned beyond recognition. But all night long, there has been rumor and speculation about the names of the victims in that house. Among those believed slain on East 54th Street were the escaped convict Donald DeFries, known as Marshal Sin Q of the Symbionese Liberation Army. It was Sin Q whose voice, along with Patty Hearst, appeared on those recordings sent to the publisher Randolph Hearst. Also, Nancy Ling Perry, a former college cheerleader who once campaigned for Barry Goldwater and also worked for a time as a topless blackjack dealer. Kamala Hall, daughter of a Lutheran minister who once was involved in a career as a social worker in Minneapolis and until she joined the SLA was known by her friends as an advocate of nonviolence. William Lawton Wolfe, son of a Pennsylvania doctor and dropout from the University of California in Berkeley. But we must emphasize all this is speculation not based on anything official. Three of the bodies were found underneath the floor of the burned out house near air vents leading to the outside. Dr. Thomas Noguchi held a news conference a short while ago. We hope to have film of that news conference later on in this program. In the news conference, Noguchi says it'll be 24 hours before the identifications are complete. Larry Carroll was among the dozen members or so of our news team that spent the good part of the day at the scene of this shootout. Reporters, film cameramen, sound men, and film couriers who faced the tension and the danger, and there was danger, believe me. Here's Larry with the first in a series of reports on what happened down there tonight. Here's the way it started, John. Late this afternoon, Los Angeles news media were notified by police that the police might have a raid somewhere in South Los Angeles and that a command post was being set up. We rushed to the area. The exact location of the target house was not known at that point, but shortly after 5 o'clock, massive numbers of police moved in and cordoned off an eight-square block area, bordered by Long Beach Boulevard on the east and Hooper on the west from 52nd Street, south four blocks. I was standing about 100 yards away when police found their target, a yellow one-story house on 54th near Compton. A live CBS camera crew was on the scene, and this is what it looked like. Police. Let's, uh, let's see if we couldn't still get this picture, but from a little better location, huh? Well, I don't know if it's a good idea to interview somebody right now. <laughs> well, that's a mighty thin palm tree right in front of us. We just took a bullet a couple inches or so because we felt it go by. We felt it go by, that's for <laughs> And heard it. And heard it. And that's as close as I want to be to one, let me tell you. It was about then that a lone black woman came stumbling from the front of the house, her hands bound behind her, gasping from the tear gas. The woman shouted at the attacking police that she was giving up and that she had been held hostage. Officers rushed into the crossfire and pulled her bodily out of the danger area. Under intense questioning, she told police that there were four more heavily armed people inside, and all the while the battle continued. A short time later, no one really knew why, fire was spotted coming from the house. It appears to have spread to the adjacent house. It does. It is just unbelievable that there could be anybody in there shooting back. We were told earlier in the afternoon that there was a basement in that house. Perhaps uh, the people who were being sought were in that basement. If so, that would give them a few more minutes to uh, stay alive and uh, fire back at the police. Oh, boy. Not, big, not much more than that. Look at the huge ball of smoke and flame going up out of here now. Right, Bob. 
Several companies of the Los Angeles Fire Department were poised at both the north and south ends of the battle zone, but police would not allow them near the blaze because in spite of the inferno, firing from the house continued. Much of it organized, some of it the explosions caused by round upon round of ammunition igniting in that intense heat. Huge clouds of dense black smoke blew eastward from the house and could be seen for miles. The flames destroyed the target house and heavily damaged two others. It was a full hour later, after the firefight began, that firemen were finally allowed in the area. Luckily, they were able to extinguish the flames quickly before the blaze spread further. But suddenly, in the space of slightly more than an hour, what had been a relatively quiet neighborhood had become a battleground, and then a scene of total desolation. The experience of watching the Holocaust in progress was more shocking, more terrifying than anything I have ever experienced. I crouched on the floor of a corner grocery store about 100 yards from the bombardment for more than half an hour with about 15 men, women, and children, all part confused, part excited, and all of them scared enough not to want to leave that floor. And when it was over, everyone seemed to know what had just happened to them, but it'll be a while before any of us really knows what it all really meant. Judd? Thanks, Larry. Christine Lund was also in the thick of things throughout the afternoon. Here is her report, including how she walked into the eye of the storm without realizing exactly what kind of dangerous situation she was in. Christine? Judd, it, it did start out that way. I realize now, and I realized rather recently, that something unique did happen the moment that I did arrive on the scene this afternoon. I walked up to the house almost immediately that you just saw burned to the ground, presumably with five SLA members inside. When I got there, a little girl, and she wasn't more than five years old, walked up to me and she said, I live in that house, the yellow house you saw burned, with my mother, and there are five people inside who I don't know, and they've all got guns. I walked up to that house. First, I talked with some of the neighbors. They said that they hadn't seen any kind of unusual activity. I knocked on the door of that yellow house, and a woman came out, a black woman. She seemed dazed, quite dazed. She refused to acknowledge that that little girl was her own. And she refused to acknowledge that there were any strangers or anything unusual going on inside. But several hours later, of course, that house had burned to the ground and with perhaps five SLA members dead inside after the most dramatic gun battle in Los Angeles history, they're saying tonight. But first, police attention was focused on an abandoned apartment building half a block away with the two vans, a red VW bus, and the blue Chevrolet van that the SLA had been seen in yesterday. Just before the LAPD SWAT squad searched the building, I walk up to the apartment they were watching and knocked, the door was unlocked. I heard, had it just cracked and heard some movement inside, but then the massive gunfire exploded a half a block away from that house. When that gun battle erupted, we moved down the street. There were sharpshooters and FBI. They raced to positions just around the corner from the house, about 100 feet away. The air shook with gunfire, and police realized what they were up against. Woman walking. Come here, lady. Get out of there. Okay. Rudy David, let's listen up, because we're going to need your assistance. Now, we need uh, all the gas that you can round up from Parker Center or any geographical division, and we need it down here, coat uh, three, as fast as you can get it down. In addition to that, we need all the ammo that we've got in the safe. We're taking automatic fire front and back from this location. They're much better armed than we are. Police, right along with reporters and with stunned bystanders, tried to figure out exactly where the crossfire was. People I saw crouched behind cars and fences and telephones, not knowing if they were out of the line of fire or not. Gunfire was so massive, it was absolutely impossible to tell if you were safe or not. Then police went to tear gas bombs. They made a direct hit into the window of the house with one lob, but somebody inside got it right away and pitched it back outside immediately. And then suddenly, the black woman inside stumbled out of the house and she slumped on a porch briefly. Tear gas choked the air. It made it impossible to breathe or even to see for a while. But then police moved in. I saw them walk up. They grabbed the woman, handcuffed her, dragged her 40 feet to a squad car. Police at the time had no idea whether she was an SLA captive or an SLA member. Just before reporters were routed out, I got up close and I saw that she was swollen from the tear gas and unrecognizable and bleeding heavily from the nose. And I heard her say that she had been held unwillingly inside by the SLA and she was thrown to the ground and questioned by police.
Is it a man, woman, Are they white? Are they white people? Back up, back up. Let him talk. Are they white people? Back up. Are they white people? And then suddenly, the SLA house belched smoke and then flames spewed out into the street. It looked like an explosion of fire. The woman looked up into the back seat of the squad car where she was under intensive questioning to see it, perhaps. There was a tremendous amount of apparent gunfire at this time, and it's possible at this point that the flames themselves were setting off the tremendous amounts of ammunition that the SLA had stockpiled inside the house. And in a way, it was a bizarre thing to see a fire of this intensity with people inside the burning house with no one attempting to fight it whether everyone stood around speculating whether the SLA at this point might possibly consider surrendering when there seemed no hope at all of their winning a gun battle with police that numbered more than 350 at this point. A few moments later, in a house immediately next to this, we see, we will perhaps and perhaps not see film of six children, I think all of them were under seven years old, being uh, rescued from that house. They all came stumbling out onto the sidewalk with a woman who apparently was their mother. No one knew what their connection might possibly have been with that house, and everyone had thought perhaps those houses had been evacuated. They hadn't been, although even now we haven't heard any reports of any injuries, either from gunfire or from the flames in that neighborhood. And uh, there's still a lot of questions being asked right now, and there aren't too many answers to go along with them. I asked Pete Hagen, spokesman for the Los Angeles Police Department, whether he'd ever seen anything like this in his life. I hadn't, no other reporters had. And I said, perhaps Watts. And he said, no, this is the worst thing that he'd ever seen. Well, Christine, I have a question. Uh, the woman that uh, described herself as a hostage that came out of the That's house, right. was that the woman that answered That's the door? That's what I've been thinking about. No, uh, frankly, her skin was, dar was a darker black. She, uh, I told you she was swollen almost unrecognizably from the tear gas, which had been lobbed in there time and time again. The air was filled with tear gas. It's possible it was the same woman, but I really don't think so. Well, it all began about 10 minutes until 6 o'clock, about 5.50. That's, right. That's when the, uh, the actual firing began. What That's time right. were you there earlier? We got there at 4 o'clock, so there was about an hour there to speculate what was going to happen. The streets were filled with people, sharpshooters. I'd never seen anything like it. Good to have you back safe, Christy. Glad Thanks. to be back. Coming up next, Chuck Henry with a report on the fire that destroyed the house. And Henry Alfaro retraces several incidents of violence that seem to fit together and lead up to tonight's tragedy. As we said before, the Los Angeles police used a record amount of ammunition in that shootout today. Chuck Henry was there, and he has a report tonight on the large amount of firepower along with some significant details about the house fire itself. John? Yes, John, we have that. Little did I know that within 20 minutes after the 5 o'clock newscast, I'd find myself right in the middle of that gunfire. Sparked by an almost constant volley of tear gas canisters from the police officers, that small yellow wood-framed home on 54th Street was quickly engulfed in flames, as you can see here. As my camera crew and I moved in for a closer angle, policemen on bullhorns could be heard calling for the suspects to give themselves up, but apparently it was too late. With the thick smell of tear gas choking our lungs, the special weapons team evacuated the adjoining homes, two of which caught fire and were gutted by this fire. As all of this was going on, ammunition was exploding in the burning home with bullets ricocheting across the street and indeed across the block. Then after perhaps, oh, 20 minutes, it seems like much longer, the first of several fire units arrived onto the scene to the surprise of police officers. To say that the police officers would, were angered would be an understatement. You could hear them yelling there for the firemen to get out of the line of fire, but apparently the firemen never gave it a second thought, and with bullets flying all over the place, they went about their business. First watering down the main blaze and then trying to save two adjoining homes. All of this as officers armed with M16 stood by. Finally, exploding shells proved too much, and the firemen were forced to back off. When the fire was finally out, investigators then moved in. And this film, shot by cameraman Bill Whitman, as you can see, shows one officer picking up what looked like at first to be um, two grenades. And then we saw that he had what uh, then appeared to be uh, what remained of perhaps a rifle or a machine gun. Whatever it was, it was a weapon used by those inside the home. Now, an interesting thing happened to me while covering that story, and uh, I hate to think of the consequences, really. As I was huddled behind that fire truck, I was holding a, a film magazine, which we used just like this one, and soundman Gordon Willingham was behind me, and we could hear the bullets ricocheting, and I heard what sounded like a, a loud plink. It's almost that at first I thought it was a rock, apparently hit the magazine, and uh, Gordon said, look out, and I looked down on my sleeve, and this is what I found. This is a shell. As you can see, it had uh, ricocheted, a bullet had ricocheted off the film magazine, 
and landed on my arm. Did you say you felt your arm as well, and then later you detected that it was uh, aching? No, the, the arm didn't ache. The, the bullet was hot, but it landed on the, on the sleeve of the coat here, and I, I quickly you know, hit it and knocked it on the ground. But uh, that is an experience that I will not soon forget. Wow. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Bob Banfield was also on the scene. His report concerns people not connected with the SLA, but nevertheless involved in the events of the night. Bob? Yes, Judd, about 30 minutes uh, before this whole thing got underway, there was almost a carnival-like atmosphere there because we didn't think that anything was going to come up. Police did a good job of keeping us away from that marked apartment on 54th Street, and it's well that they did. But then, it all ended with the first burst of gunfire. No announcement was needed to clear the streets. This is the Ethel Turpin family and her children. They were roused from their apartment directly across the street from the SLA hideout. They were confused. They were frightened. Because see, she just yeah. had operation and she came sure. around too Stay down, you'll be all right. Okay, just stay down right now. I think it'll all be over in a minute now. Oh, look. It should be over. You I seem to be okay. Just okay. keep right down. Well, it wasn't over in a minute. It was over in about an hour later. This, uh, the police at one point when the fire was put out thought they had a bomb. So everybody was rushed back. And it struck me as funny that just moments before it was every man for himself in a war. And a few seconds later, the police action was pointed toward the citizens well, and media no for their own protection. As a matter of fact, the LAPD did such a good job, they swept William Sullivan of the FBI right outside the police lines as I tried to interview him. Yes, yes. Talked to one lady who tried to be as helpful as she could. Didn't really want to commit herself, I don't think, when she had this to say. on the porch the first part of the morning. And then uh, they went inside, but one of them came right here to go to the little market there. What did they look like? I don't know. Were they white? Were they black? Uh, they weren't white. Interesting comment. They weren't white. But the lady didn't see all of the people in that small house. There were a great many people in South Central Los Angeles in the small homes and the apartments around there who just uh, got to their homes to safety. Most of them, they told me, lay down on the floor to wait the whole thing out. Then they come out to see what was left. Shooting Judd is not, uh, is not foreign to that particular area of the city, I'm sorry to say, nor are large groups of policemen, but it really is amazing that uh, none of the innocent people were killed. This is a day that the reporters here at Eyewitness News aren't likely to forget. What an experience. That's for sure. The 24 hours leading up to tonight's shootout almost defy belief and read like a scenario. From 5 o'clock last evening, it seemed the suspected SLA members were almost constantly on the move, traveling from one part of town to another, from Inglewood to Linwood, from Hawthorne to Hollywood Hills. Henry Alfaro, who's been on the story since early morning, is going to retrace the past 24 hours. Henry? Well, Judd, up until about 5 o'clock last night, the Sibonese Liberation Army was believed to be in Northern California. But suddenly, the picture changed. It began yesterday afternoon at Mel's Sporting Goods store in Inglewood. There, the attempted theft of a pair of socks turned into a shooting spree, which left the store riddled with automatic weapon fire. But fortunately, no one was hurt. A clerk had challenged the theft by a man and woman. The man pulled a gun, which he lost during the ensuing scuffle. At that point, a woman waiting for the pair in a parked van across the street opened fire, strafing the storefront. The pair escaped. Later, they abandoned the van and at gunpoint commandeered two cars in succession, telling the owner of one they belonged to the SLA. All three vehicles were found by police. At 7 o'clock, the story moved to nearby Linwood. There, 18-year-old Tom Matthews took a young woman, a stranger, for a test ride in a van he had for sale in front of his house. With that move, young Matthews became a kidnapped victim because the woman's companion was waiting for him. A Linwood police lieutenant picks up the story from that point. They forced the young man to get into the back of the van and they covered him with a blanket. The male and the female that were picked up got into the back of the van also. From that point in time, they began to drive. The victim doesn't know which direction they took or how far they traveled. He did learn from conversation that took place in the van between the parties that they needed a hacksaw because the man had a handcuff on him and they had to get the ha hacksaw removed, uh, the hacksaw to remove the handcuff. Uh, they obtained a hacksaw, and they believe the hacksaw was obtained in a Zodi store because the young man in the back of the van saw a Zodi sack nearby him, nearby where he was lying. 
After getting the hacksaw, they went to a drive-in movie. Uh, information leads us to believe that the drive-in movie that they went to was in the city of Englewood. They stayed in the drive-in movie until sometime around 1 a.m. They continued to drive in an area that's unknown to the victim. They made a couple of stops. They stopped at some residence, uh, and they did make a contact with whoever they were trying to contact. They continued to drive. They eventually wound up in the hills of Hollywood somewhere near Mulholland Drive. Now, this uh, seems to be about 6.30 this morning. They had guns in the van. They wrapped the guns. They had two long rifles and two pistols, according to the victim. They wrapped those guns in the blanket that had been covering uh, the young man whose van they were in. Uh, they got out, didn't say anything to him, left him there, and they disappeared. At almost the same time, a virtual army of FBI agents and police officers were preparing to storm a small house in South Los Angeles, where they believed the SLA members to be holed up. The suspense lasted until after 9 o'clock, when a barrage of tear gas ganisters were pumped into the house. But the house proved to be unoccupied. The suspects had left hurriedly, leaving behind them clothes, wigs, food, and ammunition. Continued surveillance of the area turned up two other vans suspected of belonging to the SLA, and in turn resulted in tonight's showdown on 54th Street. John? All right, Henry, thank you very much. We just checked with the county coroner's office, and here is the latest on the identification of the five persons killed tonight. The bodies are believed to be three men and two women, but all five bodies were so badly charred that the sex of the victims has not been definitely determined. The bodies are en route now from the shootout scene to the coroner's office in downtown Los Angeles, and a spokesman for the coroner's office says no further tests of any significance will be conducted tonight, which tends to confirm our earlier report that there will be no positive identification on these victims until 24 hours has passed. Despite tonight's spectacular and, of course, deadly shootout in South Central Los Angeles, all the questions about kidnapped Patricia Hurst, and for that matter, the Symbionese Liberation Army, remain unanswered. We do not know with any certainty the whereabouts of Patty Hearst. We do not know the identity of the five dead suspects in that burned out house. We don't know the whereabouts of the rest of the SLA membership last rumored to be fanning out from San Francisco. In other words, the SLA even now is still shrouded in mystery, much the same mystery that surrounded it late last year when the SLA first came to public attention by taking credit for the assassination of the Oakland school's chief, Dr. Marcus Foster. And you ask about the Hearst family in Hillsborough. Tonight, the head of the FBI in San Francisco, Charles Bates, made a trip out to the Hearst home. We don't know what he had to say. Coming up next on Eyewitness News, bombs explode throughout Dublin, Ireland, and the Middle East is tottering on the brink once again.